Thank you. That's very kind. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Okay. I hope you had a good break. Okay, so obviously in the first half, we've added our drums and our guitars. We're going to take this opportunity just to have a sort of fresh pair of ears on our project, which is always really valuable. Worth bearing that in mind whenever you're working on something for a long period of time. Ears get tired. So it's fair to say I think we should just refresh where we are with this project, just remind ourselves what we've done so far, and just run it down from the top once, and then we'll start thinking about vocals. Okay, so I've pulled those guitars down in volume, partly because they're too loud, but also because of what we're about to do next, which is to think about the vocal part of this track. And to help me with that, I'd like you to give a very warm round of applause to Kate, who's coming out to sing for us. Hello, hello. Okay, so... In a minute, Kate's going to sing. Now, you will remember that when we were working with the drums at the beginning, I told you that we needed to be careful because all of the mics on Tom's kit ran the risk of running through the computer up to the PA and we were going to get a feedback loop. And we run exactly the same risk here. Obviously, we didn't have that problem with Marius because there were no microphones on stage for him. But what we're going to do is just experiment with this a little bit because I'd really like to build a vocal chain for Kate to record through which you get to hear sort of being constructed. So what do I mean when I talk about a vocal recording chain? Well, if I come down to my vocal track, which is just sitting here at the moment, with the exception of the preamp, set up as it is at the moment with phantom power, ready for Kate's recording through the microphone, which we'll come to in a moment because it's particularly tasty. Um, what I've got is uh, the phantom power all ready to go, but what I haven't got are any plugins ready for Kate to sing. Now, that's fine, I suppose. I could just go into record arm mode and press record, and Kate could do her thing. But I really want her to feel like she's connected to this project. And from the beginning, what we've now done is to add reverbs to snares, and the guitars are much kind of bigger, and they're much more spatial. And so Kate's sort of struggling in a sort of dry recording space to add her performance to that isn't going to be particularly easy. So I'm going to run a little bit of a risk. I'm going to back the volume down a bit. Uh, and I'll adjust it again if I need to, just to make sure we don't get any feedback. But what I'm going to try and do is just put you into record mode, and fingers crossed. Yeah, well, that could have been worse. Can we just see if we've got some level? One, two. Mm -hmm. We go round and round and round. Okay, hopefully you can hear that a little bit. So what I'm going to do is to start thinking about the sorts of plugins I would recommend you think about when it comes to configuring a recording for a vocal. The first thing I'm going to do is to double click here and put in Logic's channel EQ. Let's bring that over here for a moment. I want to be able to hear the kind of sweetness which is sort of naturally in Kate's vocal enhanced even more. We've got a lot of weight and power in this song and I kind of want her vocal to sit on top of that and provide this really airy, floaty quality amongst other properties as well. So I'm going to just dial this up a bit and hopefully, Kate, if you can sing for us a bit, we'll hear what the effect of this high shelf filter can do. Go around in circles, yeah, treat you, babe, but you know that I'm the best thing you wish you never so if I put that back up again, we can hear that warmth. Kate, one more time, please. Go around in circles, yeah, treat you, babe. But you know that I'm the best thing you wish you never, ever had. Thank you. Okay, so we've got some EQ. Now, what we're getting is all this really lovely character. And a huge part of that is, of course, because Kate's a fantastic singer. But she's being helped out by a Neumann U87 microphone a beauty, if you will. So we've got this fantastic mic on stage ready to capture this great sound for us. So we've got EQ. That's going to give us a little bit of warmth and a little bit of extra tone. 
What I'm also going to do is to configure a compressor for Kate to sing through as well, because I think that's going to help her feel, sort of from a volume point of view, that she can open up a little bit where she wants to, and it's not going to overload or become too much. I'm going to select the vintage FET model for vocal recording, which is just sitting here. This is a really great sounding compressor. And I'm going to add a fair amount of this. Now, of course, at the moment, Kate's deliberately singing quietly for me because I want to talk to you at the same time. So it's entirely possible that these settings that we're working on are going to be quite right when she decides to open up and sing a bit later. But that's fine. We can adjust those when the time comes. So I'm going to set a nice low threshold so we're compressing plenty of the sound. And I'm going to set the ratio nice and high as well so that anything above the threshold point that she sings is being reined in a little bit. Again, I'm turning off auto gain, and I'm going to add a little bit of this, but I can't really know until we actually do this for real how much of that is going to be the right amount. OK, Kate, can we have a little bit more vocal, and we'll see how the compressor's behaving. Mm, oh, oh, we go round, we go round. And could you sing a little bit more strongly for me, please? Oh. Fantastic. OK, so we've got our compressor beginning to respond as well. Now, at the moment, Kate's still in a dry space. We've got her tone a bit more under control, and we've got the compressor also bringing dynamics under control. But I can also monitor reverb in real time as we make recordings as well. So what I'm now going to do is to fire up this nice long reverb, and we'll hear that. Mm. Oh. That's really lovely, isn't it? OK, let's also add one more reverb, just because I'm a bit of a reverb addict. We'll have a medium plate on this as well. A bit of that too, please, Kate. La, 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 la. OK, now what we've got is a space in which I think Kate will feel like she's much more part of the track. I need to remember to drop the vocal, uh, sorry, the um, PA level now, because we are about to make a vocal recording. And what this is going to allow us to do is to, uh, this channel uh, that we've uh, configured here is going to let us just, I hope, let Kate feel like she's part of the recording. But what I'm going to do is just make sure that the compressor is open through this recording stage. I'll make it a bit smaller so that we can see the vocal going down as well. I can resize these windows. But this, I think, is probably the plugin I'm most likely to need to make adjustments to as we make a recording. So let's also make the, guitar, uh, the um, vocal track nice and big so we can see this as it goes down. And we'll head back to the top of the project. So what I'm going to do is to give Kate one bar of counting before we get into the intro section of the song, if that's OK. We've got the channel all set up and ready to go. So let's make a recording and see how we go. If you could sing relatively uh, gently for me this first time, that would be fantastic. Thank you. OK, and obviously, uh, I should have said this with Tom, but it's even more critical now. This microphone's live, so if you could stay nice and quiet while Kate records, that would be magical. Thank you. OK, let's make a recording. A love as hard can be cruel. A love as hard can be so cruel. I'm out here breaking a rule. Feel my heart beating louder Cause I've got nothing to prove And now I'm coming for you Now a storm comes I can hunt her I can feel it Thank you, Kate, and thank you all of you for staying nice and quiet as well. Now, I sent Kate up a bit of a uh, blind alley there, which, of course, you weren't able to hear because we're the only two people wearing headphones. And this brings me really neatly onto the next part of what we need to consider if you are making recordings in the same space as the artist that's recording. And that's true for most of us. Most of us don't have studios with partitions or separated spaces. So it's really easy to make one potentially fatal error, which is Kate's wearing closed back headphones, which means that the amount of spill coming out of her headphones is contained, whereas mine 
are studio models, which means that they spill much more. And if I don't really keep my headphone levels under consideration, it's entirely possible the amount of spill that's coming out of my headphones will make its way over to Kate's mic and get captured as part of the recording. And a little bit of that happened right at the beginning. And the other thing that happened this time was that I hadn't really quite got the preamp level right, or indeed the makeup gain dial right within the compressor either. So I'm actually going to be bold, and I'm going to delete this file. I'm going to ask Kate to perform it again for me. And this time, hopefully, she's got a level that's going to be a little bit easier to work to, if that's OK. Let's try that one more time. So exactly the same thing again, four clicks in, and then the intro. Thank you, Kate. can be cool, a love's heart can be so cool, I'm at it breaking the rules, feel my heart beating louder, cause I've got nothing to lose, and now I'm coming for Beautiful. Was that easier to sing to that time? Great. OK. Right, one more pass. We're going to make one more recording of this. I'm going to ask Kate to sing it a bit stronger this time. I'm going to trust that my preamp settings, which I've turned up for this quieter vocal performance, are going to be OK for this louder one, too. Yeah, this is the time to cough. Clear your throats. The tension in the room. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Let's get all of that out right now. We could do this for the next two hours. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try one more time. If you could sing it a little bit stronger for me, that would be fantastic. And uh, I'm going to ask you all to keep quiet one more time. A lover's heart can be cruel. A lover's heart can be so cruel. I'm out here breaking the rules. Hear my heart beating louder Cause I've got nothing to lose And now I'm coming for you Now a storm comes like a hunter I can feel it deep in my heart It'll break us, it'll take Fantastic, thank you. OK, so we've now got a lead vocal, and I think we can do some really great things with that. So within this project, we can go back to the beginning. I'm just going to close these down. Now, before when we looked at recording multiple takes, we were in cycle mode. But you can see that this time I pressed stop and went back to the beginning. But Logic has still recorded those into a separate take folder. And I'm going to repeat the same trick that I did with Marius, which is that I want to duplicate this part, because Kate and I have also talked about maybe adding some harmonies to this project as well. Okay, do you want to hear the lead vocal as I record the harmonies? Great. Okay, so we'll take the compressor out because I think the setting's working nicely for us now. I'm going to loop up the chorus as I did for Marius, which means that, Kate, you're going to hear four beats into the top of the chorus. And we're going to go around four times this time, just because I'm a bit of a slave driver and I want Kate to work hard. We've talked about two lower harmonies and two upper ones as well. So she's going to record all four of those. So again, this is the time to cough. Ah, comedy coughing, great. OK, so we'll uh, go around this, if we can, just four times. Can I hear it once? Of course, absolutely. So we're going to just check this through. Let me know when you're ready, OK? Fantastic, OK. So we're going to go back to the top of here. And in fact, actually, it's really great that Kate asked me to check that because I can now hear this coming through my headphones. So I'm going to just turn those lev that level down altogether. Yours will be as it was before. OK, let's add these harmonies. Here it comes. Deep in 
Thank you so much. Round of applause for Kate, please. Yeah, there you go. Relax again now. Fine. OK, so um, what I've done is to mute the harmonies. We're going to come to those in a little while. What we're going to do now is to focus a little bit more on this lead vocal performance. Now, again, as I said a moment ago, we've got takes recorded within this particular project. And we saw with the guitar recording with Marius that we can take two takes and very easily double track them and have them both work within the same project. Well, I don't want to do that with Kate. What I want to do instead is to choose my favorite takes for different parts of the song. So I asked her to sing gently the first time, that's take one. And then I asked her to go for it a bit more the second time round, which is take two. And I think that probably if we open these up and have a look at them and we see the two takes side by side, working on, <coughs> excuse me, the gentler performance for the first half of the song going into the stronger one will work really nicely. Now you can see that what I've done in order to make that happen is simply just to swipe across the take that I want to use. If I want to substitute this one line, I can do that by just literally swiping over that individual take and I can swap any line in or out that I want to in order to just create what we call a comp. And up here at the top, you can see the comped file waiting for me. Now, you can also see that what Logic's done in order to just ease the transitions between those regions is to create what we call a crossfade, a little moment that's just going to make sure that we don't get any clicks as we move from one audio file to another. Now, I definitely want the whole of this first take to run through up to this point, I think, and then we're going to switch across to the chorus um, uh, into the second take. So I think from a take point of view, that's going to work nicely for us. But what I also want to do, as well as editing from a selection process, and it's worth, just before I move on actually here, bearing in mind that I wasn't joking before, we could have recorded 16 passes. And generally speaking, you won't just want two vocal takes. You will want to spend time really building a session this way. And my advice to you would be to record all of those tracks on top of one another, because quick swipe comping like this makes it really easy to then make selections for one part after another, as opposed to recording on multiple tracks and loads of mutes, all that kind of stuff. This is really straightforward. So once I've got a comp that I'm happy with, what I can then do is to close that down. And then what I want to do is I want to commit these changes and say, yep, I'm happy with this particular edit. And to do that, I'm going to click here, and I'm going to flatten this performance. And what that does is to throw away those other takes, and it just gives me one audio region sitting on top of my project with the crossfade in at that point where we've selected it. And hopefully now we've got a sound that we can work with. It's time for me to turn the volume back up so we can actually hear it. And we should hear that pass going from, let's just run it from the bridge. We should hear this slightly gentler performance going into the stronger one on the chorus. She's good, isn't she? OK, so we've now got this fantastic lead vocal, which we can begin to craft in a whole range of ways. Now, Kate is obviously a professional singer, and it's fair to say that I could live with this performance the whole way through. But it's also true that if we were working with singers who maybe were a little bit less secure in their pitching, um, one thing we might want to do would be to begin to explore the idea of working with tuning a vocal. Now, earlier on, we looked at what we can do with flex time when it comes to working with drum parts. And if I open up flex mode on this uh, performance, what I can see is that there's a dedicated flex mode specifically called flex pitch, which is for exactly what I'm talking about. And if I select this, Logic very quickly is going to go through and produce a pitch line having detected the pitches that have, been, um, have gone into Kate's performance. Now, I can see those a little bit here. I've got this kind of overview display. But if I select the Edit button here, what I've got a chance to do if I select Track is to see the waveform. Let's just make this a little bit smaller so we can see it clearly. And then what I can do is to go and find that detected pitch and overlay it on top so we can see very clearly how Logic has assessed the pitch of Kate's performance and where it's put it. So in other words, this piano roll display on the left-hand side is showing me where Logic has detected these pitches so that we can begin to make edits to those if we want to. 
So I'm going to solo this vocal part and we'll just have a listen to it and just begin to see how the pitching is. A lover's heart can be cool A lover's heart can be so cool I'm out here breaking the rules Hear my heart beating louder Okay, so let's just focus on that particular section. What do all of these lines actually mean? Okay, well, let's select one note like this one. If I click on it, it's going to make a noise and I can hear the formants, the individual components that make up that particular note. And you can see it highlighted up on the screen there as well as a wavy line. Now, the first thing to say is that, and I can probably make this even larger so we can see it even more clearly. The first thing that's happened is that Logic has detected this pitch as very nearly sort of being a D. It's somewhere between D and E flat. And the reason I can see that is because I can see the line between those two pitches, but I can also see that this block of um, sort of analyzed pitch is slightly above the bottom layer. In other words, this note is slightly sharp if it's supposed to be a D, and it's slightly flat if it's supposed to be an E flat. And what I can do is to make really tiny microscopic adjustments to pitching based on the nodes around the edge of any individual note. So I've got six little uh, nodes in the corners of each of these, and what they do is to allow me to adjust different parameters. So in the top left-hand corner, I've got what's called pitch drift. How does this note bend in from the previous one? Now, it might drop down from the previous one, or it might bend up from the previous one, and pitch drift allows me to manage that transition between two notes. What I can do up here at the top is to go for fine tuning. Now, as I say, Logic's detected this note clearly as an E flat, and at the moment it's telling me that it's 38 cents below that particular pitch. Okay, well, we can adjust that in a minute. Here, we've got pitch drift at the other end. This note sort of stops before the next phrase, but if it bent into another note, that's where I could adjust that. Here, I've got control over vibrato, and that's what the main part of this wavy line is. Kate's got amazing control over vibrato. What tends to happen with singers is that they'll establish a note and then they'll begin to introduce pitch variation, which we call vibrato. And you can see the wavy line and the height of that is showing me how much vibrato I've got in this note and then I can make adjustments to it if I want to. I can also control its volume. If there's one note that just absolutely pings out and is much louder than everything else, I can turn its volume down. But also more usefully, if you suddenly get to the end of a phrase and your singer is running out of air, it's a nice way of being able to just boost the volume of things that maybe have just tailed off a little bit. So on a per note basis, I could go through this entire vocal performance and make adjustments to all of those notes. And actually, to be honest, that would produce, without question, the most natural result, because of course, every single note is different. Again, just like Tom, Kate isn't a machine, so pitch is gonna come and go from one note to the next. However, I can also make global changes, and we're gonna start there just to see what happens when I do. So if I select all of the notes within here, over on the left-hand side, I've got a pitch correction slider, which at the moment is off at zero. What we heard a moment ago, absolutely no pitch correction at all. So what we're gonna do is to run the verse again, and this time what I'm going to do is to slowly increase the pitch correction, and we'll compare no pitch correction with tuned vocals. We'll have to wait and see whether or not um, Logic is going to push that sharp or flat, and maybe we'll have to make a manual adjustment to it. So here it is untuned again. A lover's heart can be cool A lover's heart can be so cool I'm out here breaking the rules Okay, so there's just those two phrases. Now let's turn on pitch correction and see where that takes us. Straight away, the waveform has snapped, and we've got those notes now much more, uh, well, perfectly tuned. Whether or not they've tuned to the right semitones or not, uh, only play will tell us. A lover's heart can be cool. A lover's heart can be so cool. Okay, so the answer is no. What's happened is these notes have pushed themselves a little sharper than we'd like them to. And in fact, that's consistently true. All of these notes should be these. So what we're gonna do is to run it through again. And now all I have to do to make this adjustment is to click on these notes and pull them down. Again, as I click on each one, we're gonna hear the components that make up that detected pitch. And then as we run them through, hopefully we should be able to make pretty quick changes to this vocal. I love it cool. 
A lover's heart can be so cool. So this one's sharp as well. Let's carry on. I'm out here breaking the rules. That one's gone sharp too. Hear my heart beating louder. Cause I've got nothing to lose. This one too. Now then, what we've got here is a really interesting moment, which we've actually seen a little bit earlier as well, which is that Logic knows that there is a pitch ramp here, but it's detected this as one note. So if I want to be able to make an adjustment here, I've got a problem, because at the moment, we've got one block of data, even though the detected line clearly sweeps all the way down here. So how am I going to solve that? Well, I can just punch in, grab the scissors, and chop this here. And instantly, what we've got now are two notes, which can be just adjusted manually. So let's carry on. And now I'm coming for you. Okay, so we've gone sharp here as well. I think this one's going to be sharp. You. Twitchy on that note there. Now a storm comes like a hunter. I can feel it. Okay, so I've got one little adjustment to make here as well. There we go. Okay, now, I've obviously been describing what I've been doing as I've been going through, but you can see how quickly it's possible to take a vocal like this and put it in tune. I think now, probably our lead vocal's absolutely bang in tune. But what we're gonna do now is to look at what happens when we make another adjustment. So I'm gonna just make all of this a little bit clearer so we can see more of these notes at the same time. I'm gonna select all of them once more, and this time what I'm going to do is to come down to the vibrato function here, and I'm going to just pull this down all the way to zero. Okay? Now what this is going to do is to remove Kate's vibrato altogether. Now this is obviously not going to produce a particularly natural result, um, because now we're going to sort of just pretend that she's sort of like a talk box, something which, uh, 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 an instrument which is uh, almost controllable like a keyboard. Let's just hear what that sounds like. A lover's heart can be cool A lover's heart can be so cool I'm out here breaking the rules Hear my heart beating louder Okay, so this is the production trick that's kind of gone in and out of favour for the last 20 years. If you decide that this is something that you want to bring to your productions, either to individual little components or to an entire lead vocal, Please don't do that, we've heard it, right? Okay, but nevertheless, um, if this is something you want to bring to your production, then obviously this is a, an area where you can get really creative with breaking up little bits of vocal, maybe resampling them and flying them back into your project. I'm gonna put the vibrato back in, but I'm gonna maybe just rein it a little bit um, down to, uh, I don't know, three quarters, something like that. So now let's hear this vocal, and what I'm gonna do is just make an adjustment to its level overall as well um, from a compression point of view, just to get a rough sense of what I can do in trying to uh, sort of balance this uh, vocal part within the track from uh, exclusively working with compression. A lover's heart can be cool A lover's heart can be so cool I'm out here breaking the Okay, so hopefully this dispels one of the other great myths about compressors, which is that they can be responsible for setting an overall volume for a part within a project that will work from start to finish. It's not what compressors do. 
in the first half, we talked about dynamic range and how we can rein things in in order to get them under control. But arrangements are hugely dynamic. We could build a section to this piece that drops down to just an absolute whisper. And so the compressor, at that point, working really hard, is, of course, going to produce a vocal that's too loud. Equally, it's the case that further into the project, where it really kicks off and we're getting a bit of that with Marius's guitars coming in, the vocal feels like it's drowning. Don't confuse compression and dynamic control with overall volume level. In order to really get this vocal feeling like it belongs in the track, we need to write a volume automation line for this vocal to work. Now, you'll probably be really aware of the fact that in addition to all of the hardware that we've got on stage, one really popular piece of technology that um, there's a sort of whole culture around these days is hardware controllers. The idea is of having dials and sliders and things that we can push and pull in order to actually make physical changes. It goes back to the days of working with mixing desks, which give you this great tactility, this opportunity to get hands on with the parts that you're actually working with. And actually, one thing that's worth bearing in mind is that if you happen to have access to or own an iPhone or an iPad, you actually have a hardware controller ready to work with Logic. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there's a free Logic remote app which will allow you to connect a phone or an iPad ready for you to be able to write uh, volume data and other parameters as well. And I've got a phone, and we're going to do precisely that now with this vocal line. So here, you can see Logic Remote, I hope, from where you are, which is basically showing you a channel fader, and that's the vocal, and this is my master output. Now on here, what I can also do is to select automation modes. So if I go into touch mode, we should see now that the vocal is in touch mode, which means I can go back to the beginning of my project, and what I can now do is to add a volume automation line to this vocal as it goes through. Let me come around a little bit over there, because I feel a bit marooned over here, and we'll just watch this go in in real time. I can be cool. I love us, I can be so cool. I'm out here breaking the rules. Hear my heart beating louder. Cause I've got nothing to lose. And now I'm coming for Okay, that's pretty cool, right? Okay, so what I've got now is this volume automation line which is running through. Now, it's not gonna be perfect from start to finish by any means, but what it does is to give me a rough shape of the vocal, and if you were in any doubt as to whether or not compressors could do this automatically, hopefully there you've got your answer. They aren't the same thing, a really common mistake that people make. Now, of course, this isn't perfect, and there are things that I might want to change about it, and we'll come back to that in due course. So what I'm gonna do is to again protect my automation data, go back into read mode, and then I'm going to uh, close down automation mode altogether. Now, we also asked Kate to produce um, four different harmony parts for us, and what I'm gonna do really quickly is to copy exactly the trick that I did with Marius's guitars. We're gonna unpack these two new tracks. That's going to copy the compression and EQ treatments that we set up on this uh, part, which I think are gonna work really nicely. What I'm then gonna do is to create a track stack really quickly from these, so that we've got all of the backing vocals being controlled sort of under one roof, and we'll call this backing vocals. What I can then do is to close this down. We can add more reverb if we want to, although there's plenty already on here. We could add a secondary EQ treatment. What I want here is a tone that's gonna feel thinner than the lead vocal. I don't want these to be fighting the lead vocal. So what I'm gonna do is to scoop out some of the bottom end, I'm also going to just notch out anything that feels like it might get a little bit uh, too much in the sort of upper mid-range, and um, we will leave the top end in at the moment just to sort of create this nice sort of floaty vocal. So in two or three quick little steps, we've now got a stack of backing vocals which we can balance against the lead vocal in the chorus. Let's just set a rough level for those by running the chorus section and using the volume fader for this track stack. Now a storm comes like a hunter I can feel it deep in my heart It'll break us, it'll take us over, over. And let's try
try that in the project as well and see how they sound together. Now a storm comes like a hunter. I can feel it deep in my heart. It'll break us. It'll take us over, over. Okay, I think that's going to work nicely, but it's time now definitely to have a look at this volume automation data on the lead line, which is inconsistent, particularly through this chorus section. Now, overall, the chorus vocal is too loud. And there's a really neat little tool here called Volume Select Tool, which I can access just from the toolbar. I can select a whole range of automation nodes, come back to the pointer tool, and just drag the whole lot down to make the whole of this section uh, quieter without affecting the volume of what happened up to that point. Let's just try that now. Great, okay, that's working better. And what I'm also going to do is to make a slight adjustment to the relative balance of the different backing vocals that Kate recorded too. So we're gonna come into here. Remember, she performed the lower ones first. So what I'm going to do is just to go and find these individual tracks on the low harmonies. And I'm gonna just pull these volumes down a little bit so we've got a, slightly, uh, a balance slightly more favoring the upper harmonies. Okay, so very quickly, by asking Kate to go into cycle record mode, we've been able to create this kind of stacked backing vocal effect. And of course, what we could also do would be to add more or think about spacing those out across the stereo field as well, something we'll also come back to. So what we've got now is a project that's just beginning to feel like it's getting somewhere. We've got drums, we've got guitars, and we've got our vocals. Let's have another listen before we move on to the next stage. A lover's heart can be cool A lover's heart can be so cool I'm out here breaking the rules Hear my heart beating louder Cause I've got nothing to lose Okay, so I've been able to bring some of the guitar level up a little bit more now that we've uh, captured um, the vocal and uh, the guitars aren't gonna be fighting or influencing the way that Kate performs. So what next? Well, we're getting close to having a mix file that's ready for us to print. I'm gonna have one more listen through and just check that there isn't anything that I want to adjust and we'll make those adjustments in real time, listening out for tone and volume and dynamics changes, things that we might just want to make uh, tweaks to before we commit our mix file. Let's have a listen. A lover's heart can be cool A lover's heart can be so I'm out here breaking the rules Hear my heart beating louder Cause I've got nothing to lose Okay, so we've got one consideration before we print this mix file, which is that obviously today what we've been doing is recording this all live. None of this existed before uh, we started our project. So it's no great surprise that some levels have slipped here and there. And you can see that the output um, for the entire project, I'm ever so slightly in the red. Not bad, half a dB, come on. 
It's all right, right? OK, so what I'm going to do before I commit this mix is just to make sure that we're offsetting that, OK? Now, I could go through and find out exactly where that distortion is coming from. I'm going to make an adjustment there to volume automation data in order to rein that in. But I'm going to do a slightly quick fix here and just put a gain um, plug-in in the output channel. And I'm going to just take a couple of dBs off this before we print this mix all together. Now, when it comes to uh, mixing your projects, uh, Logic's going to make this straightforward for me. What I'm going to do is to put an empty bar at the top. I'm going to just create a cycle over this, making sure that I don't pinch the end off the project at all. And what I'm going to do is just make sure as well that I'm going to reset this little meter before we commit this bounce, and I'm going to open up the bounce window. Now, we're going to be back here in a little while looking at this properly. So for now, all I'm going to do is to select a really ultra high resolution file. As you can see, we've been working at 96K. I'm going to carry on working at 96K for now, and I'm also going to carry on working um, at 24-bit. And I'm going to select an offline bounce. And we've seen that process happen a moment ago to an extent, but this time we're going to commit a mix file to the desktop, just so it's easy for me to go and find in a moment. I'm going to press bounce, and Logic's just going to sprint through and produce another offline bounce for me so that I've got this uh, quick mix file created for me ready to go into the next stage. So whilst that's just finishing up, Let's talk about what that next stage is. What we've got next is this idea of what happens when we go into the mastering of a particular piece of music. I'm just going to save this project, and I'm going to close it. And we should find that we've got a mix file ready to work with sitting up here in the top right-hand corner. And actually, as we're here, let's now immediately just start a new project as well. I'm going to select one audio track, because that's all we need this time. And I'm going to press Create. At the beginning of the project, file, import, and we're going to go and grab that audio file, which is sitting on the desktop right here, ready for us to work with. Now, when I import a new audio file, because this has been created within Logic, it's even asking me, even though it's an audio file, whether or not I want to import the tempo data, which is great. I definitely do. I'm not so worried, however, about the markers, so I'm not going to worry about those for now. So let's make this nice and big so we can see this file really clearly, and we should see the waveform that's gone into our mix file. OK, so what exactly is mastering? Well, let's talk about mastering in a more typical form than working with a one minute bit of song. Generally, what mastering engineers do is to try and consolidate and bring together a number of different pieces of music. You'll probably know that lots of pop records these days are made with producers in different countries. So even though the same artist is at the center of those projects, different producers working in different studios, different countries all over the place are producing their take on the sound, their approach to songwriting. So it's going to stand to reason I've been encouraging you to think about the originality in your own music. And we'll talk some more about that in a while too. So if those producers are doing their job, of course it stands to reason that the tone and the volume shaping and the overall level of all of those separate tracks isn't going to be the same. So what mastering, first and foremost, is for is bringing a whole number of pieces of music together and making changes to them so that as a body of work, they make more sense. Now, the same thing is true with compilation albums. If you suddenly decide that you want to put a compilation album together with tracks from the 60s where people weren't pushing the volume of tracks nearly as much as they do today, you're going to need to make balances and adjustments to those tracks so that they feel like those pieces of music belong together. So at the most basic level, what mastering does is to allow you to take lots of different pieces and make them feel like they work well together. However, that's not the whole thing. It's also fair to say there's no getting away from the fact that we tend to associate volume with quality. This is a really important point. If you go to a gig, it's loud, because loud is impressive. You'll all have done this either with your teachers or your friends. You'll make a piece of music that you're really proud of, and they come into the room, and you say, oh, you've got to listen to this. Do you turn it up or down? Yeah, always up. Come on, let's have it. I have this with my students. I always know which pieces of music they're proudest of because they blow my heads off with it. It's like, get this! Whereas the ones they're not quite so happy with, you know, just have quietly, just quietly. OK, so we associate volume with quality. It excites us. Loud volume excites us. But it's also slightly competitive. It's fair to say, I'm afraid, that when we listen to a loud piece of music followed by a quieter piece of music, subconsciously, it's easy for us to. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying it's easy for us to assume that the first piece is, second, is better than the second. So what a lot of mastering engineers need to bear in mind is that Unfortunately, there's a little bit of a volume competition going on, and something we need to bear in mind is that in order for our tracks to feel as rich and full as many of the commercial tracks that we can hear out in the big wide world, we do need to consider dynamics and inflating the volume of the tracks that we work with. So 
what does it mean to actually put together a mastering chain and what sorts of plugins might we want? Well, let's build a chain right now so we can begin to explore some of these concepts. First of all, what I'm going to do is to come and build uh, or put at the very top of my uh, chain an EQ. And I'm going to this time select a linear phase EQ. Now then, if the tone in my mix file is wrong, in other words, if I need an EQ at the very beginning of my chain, why didn't I fix it at the mix stage? If the track is clearly too bright or too dull or it doesn't have enough mid-range, why didn't I fix that at the mix stage? Well, I haven't put an EQ here because at the moment the mix file is wrong. I've put it here because the plugins that I'm going to use after the EQ might have implications for tone. So in other words, when we start working with compressors and when we start working with limiters to get the volume into our track a little bit higher, it could be that the bottom end of those tracks springs forward a little bit. It could be that the top end springs forward. And what we need to do is to make an adjustment to tone. But right now, if I immediately think, you know what, I know this track is too, uh, is too dull, for instance, I should really go back to my mix project and fix it there. It's going to be much easier for me to make really choice um, settings uh, than um, it is uh, at the mix stage than it will be to try and fix things at the mastering stage. So why have I picked linear phase EQ rather than channel EQ? Well, it's exactly the same plugin in terms of its components, in terms of the way that things are set out. But what the linear phase EQ is to preserve phase all the way through its processing. What that actually means is that Logic has to look ahead a little bit. When I press play, it's going to buffer this sound. It's going to take it into the linear phase EQ and just think about it to preserve that phase. So this is a plugin you could use and should use at the mastering stage, but I would avoid it when you're tracking and working at the recording stage because it's going to hold you up and introduce a little bit of latency. So we'll come back to the EQ if we need to in due course. The second plugin I'm going to use is a form of compression. But rather than working with stereo compression, what I want to do now is to break down the individual frequency bands of my project and have the option to be able to compress those individually. Well, what does that mean? Well, if I select the multipressor, we'll be able to see. This is a multi-band compressor, which basically means I can compress the bass differently from the lower mid-range, differently from the upper mid-range, differently from the treble. So in other words, I can select different frequency areas, and we'll hear those in a moment, and make absolutely bespoke choices about how dynamically I want them to respond. Now, the reason why that's important is that if I use stereo compression at this moment, it's entirely possible that the compressor is going to see the kick drum or the bass line, and it's going to respond, which means that the vocal, the hi-hats, and all of the frequency content at the other end of the spectrum are going to respond because there's one compressor across the entire frequency range. The multiband compressor lets me break it up into different chunks, so we'll come back there in a moment as well. Next, what we're going to do is to think about that volume offset that I was talking about. We need our track to potentially be a little louder than it is right now if it's going to feel like a mi uh, mastered mix file that belongs out with more commercially released tracks. So the adaptive limiter is going to be the plugin we'll turn to when the time comes for that. But as well as the plugins that actually make a difference to the sound, what I also want to do is to make sure that from a monitoring point of view, I'm also keeping tabs on the way that um, the project is responding. Sorry, I don't want the loudness meter. Let's just swap that out. What I want to do instead is to select the multimeter. And what this is going to let me do is to see various parameters and components of the file as we go through. I'm just going to park that down here. Now, the analyzer here is going to show the frequency content of the track as it plays through. I can also see phase here and overall output volume. So that's just going to stay there, and it will keep you seeing exactly what's present in this mix file as we go. So let's just take out the adaptive limiter for a moment. The linear EQ is flat, so I'm going to keep that exactly as it is. It's not making any difference to tone. And we're going to turn our attention to the multiband compressor to find out what we can do in here. So as I said, what this allows us to do is to break the frequency bands down into separate groups so that they can be adjusted individually. Now, the great thing about the multipressor is that you can solo those individual bands. So in other words, this mix is going to sound weird. We're only hearing what we could, I suppose, refer to as the lower mid-range in this project right now. So I'm soloing this band. And then what I'm going to do is to set the range from a frequency point of view around the area that I'm interested in. These crossover points allow me to do that. Now, at the moment, this is an incredibly wide band. And I want to focus just on sort of low mid-range for now, somewhere between about 120 hertz and let's say, yeah, OK, 430, maybe 400, somewhere around here. Now, what this will do when I hit solo is that we'll be able to hear this band playing by itself. Let's just put a loop around a section of the piece, and we'll hear 
what this band sounds like on its own. Okay, so straight away we can hear what's present in this frequency band. It's the bottom end of Kate's vocal range. We can hear the toms really clearly. There's a lot of snare in there as well, and the body of the guitars. In other words, an enormous amount of the track and its engine room in particular. Low mid-range is kind of the engine room of a track. And to show you what I mean by that, I'm gonna come out of solo mode, and I'm gonna turn the volume of this band down. We'll make it a little bit wider, and I've just dropped its volume, and we'll hear what this track sounds like with much less volume happening in the low mid-range, and then I'll punch it back in. Okay, so you can hear there's loads of drive and energy in this particular band of frequencies. But what I want to do is to sort of make the most of that, to have the dynamic range of this particular part of the frequency spectrum just be a little bit more under control. So what I'm gonna do is again solo it. I'm gonna drop the threshold point, which is right here, into this um, collection of frequencies, into the volume in this particular frequency area. And then my ratio control is here. So just as before, we have a chance to decide how much squeeze we're gonna to get to the upper frequencies or the volume of the upper frequencies in this particular band. Let's hear that in solo mode and see how the compressor responds. Okay, so you can see it going up and down as it responds particularly to the bottom of the snare drum. Let's just put that back into the mix and see how it feels now. Again, remember, if I push this up and down, I'm effectively offsetting the gain. This is like makeup gain for each individual frequency band. Okay, what I'm also gonna do is to select the sort of upper um, uh, uh, mid-range into the treble band as well, and repeat some of that process. I'm gonna set up, obviously, individual controls for this area, but there's also an enormous amount of information here. This is gonna be much more of the vocal, some of the brighter stuff that Kate sang, as well as much more of the crunch in the guitars as well. So again, let's set a ratio in here. I'm gonna work this particular band a little bit harder, and we'll see what this sounds like. So that upper band, you can really hear it responding to Kate's vocal. And what I've done is to make an adjustment as well to the attack time, how quickly the compressor responds. And uh, we've left release time where it is, how quickly it drops away again uh, as signals recover from the threshold point. 
Now, it's fair to say we're making some pretty subtle changes here, and you could be thinking, well, I can't really hear it. Well, the whole point about mastering isn't to completely reinvent the wheel. As I said before, if I had significant problems with the mix file here, I'd be much better off going back to those individual tracks and making changes there. What I'm trying to do here is to get individual bands ever so slightly more under control from a dynamics point of view. And of course, I could do the same thing at the top end with the treble, which we could make a little bit brighter or sweeter if we wanted to, or back it off if things are too harsh. And also what we could do would be to get the bass, the bottom end of this track, also more under control if that felt necessary. So you can see that the multiband compressor is an amazingly powerful tool, and the bottom end of it, if, again, I've suddenly created so many sort of volume drops as a result of my compression choices that overall the track is way quieter than it was before. I've got a chance to boost it a little bit here as well. Okay, so we then come on to the adaptive limiter and what this um, extraordinary uh, plugin is capable of doing. So compared to the multiband compression, this is pretty straightforward in terms of what we've actually got happening here. Let's just deal with uh, the only two dials that really matter here in terms of changing the overall volume of our track. What do I mean? Well, first of all, let's deal with the second one first. The output ceiling sets the volume above which the, vo the overall volume simply cannot climb. Can't get any higher than this. This is what we call a brick wall limiter, and it does what it says on the tin. It's like a brick wall. The volume isn't going to get louder than this point. So I'm going to set this at minus 0.1 decibels, okay? Some people think the digital distortion starts exactly at zero dB. There is another school of thought that suggests that it stops one-tenth of a decibel louder than that. If you can hear the difference, you have the most magic pair of ears in the world. Okay, so bear that in mind and celebrate. Okay, so we've got, I'm gonna set my output ceiling at um, minus 0.1 dB, a tenth of a decibel off zero dB. The all important dial is the one over here on the left-hand side, and this is gain. Now this is gonna turn the volume of my track up. It'd be very easy for me to stop that sentence there. But of course, it's not as simple as that. If I'm turning the volume up, A, why isn't it going to distort? And secondly, we already know, because I had to create that little gain offset in the mix project, that I've only got two decibels of headroom in this project. In other words, these peaks, the loudest moments in this waveform, probably about here, well, there's not a whole lot of room here. So if I suddenly start just turning those up in terms of volume, a bit like turning up my volume fader, then of course, very quickly, things are going to distort. So what does gain mean in this context? Well, imagine it like upside down compression. Before, we had our dynamic range, we set a threshold point, we then used ratio to pull down the volume to a point. Downwards compression makes things quieter. Imagine that upside down, okay? What we've done now is to set an output ceiling and the loudest moments of our track are gonna move up and push against that ceiling. And depending on how hard we push the gain dial, the quieter moments, all of those bits in between the transients, the bits where we haven't got really attacking qualities in our sound, are going to have volume added to them. So in other words, what we're doing is increasing average volume. Now to explain what I mean by that, let's just take an example. Let's suppose we recorded a door slam and we recorded someone using a pneumatic drill, okay? We could match the volume, the loudest moment in those two files so that they were exactly the same. The peak of that door slam and that pneumatic drill. Which one would sound louder? Anyone, don't be shy. Well, they would sound the same at the very beginning, and then what would happen? The drill would take over. It would, you would be left with the impression that that sound was louder because it's louder for longer. It's a sustained tone. So we'd get a big shock from the door slam, but a second later it would be silent. Whereas our drill, persistent, a really loud noise. You see people responding as they go down the street past drills like this. They're really horrible, loud, sustained noises. Okay, now I don't wanna start comparing our mix file to a drill, let's be careful. But what we're talking about is the same thing. Effectively, we're talking about volume being loud for longer, giving us the impression that it's louder overall. Let me show you what I mean. If we turn the gain down to zero, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to push this file up uh, in volume as we listen back to it. Now at the moment, remember that, the loudest moment here I think is about two dBs off maximum, okay? So as I go past plus two, effectively we know that the loudest moments in the track are being pushed up to maximum volume. As we keep going beyond that point, the bits at minus three or minus four or minus five are also getting pushed up in volume and the whole thing is gonna feel, on average, louder. That's what this sounds like if we run it from the top. A lover's heart can be cool A lover's heart can be 
Okay, so of course the temptation is to go up to 12 because 11 is like so 30 years ago. Okay, so we could go up to 12 and keep pushing things, but as I said, the idea here isn't just to create an absolutely flat line. By the way, just to double check, oh yeah, we're at minus 0.1 in the output because the output ceiling is ensuring that we never climb above zero, okay? So what we're doing is we're adding gain to a point which hopefully feels like it's natural. We're not trying to introduce artifacts or distortion or push things too hard here. And it's really important that we understand that all of the nuance that's gone into the performances of the musicians that we've had on stage are captured in this mix file. It's not up to us just to decide, you know what, loud's great. We just want it to be absolutely slammed. I'm delighted to say that modern, mas uh, modern mastering convention has looking to preserve dynamics in a way that actually 20, 30 years ago wasn't really happening. What we had was just brick wall mixes. It's actually worth importing some stuff off CD from the sort of late 90s and just having a look at the waveform. You'll find it's an absolutely solid black line. Okay, this whole idea of what we call the loudness wars, look it up on Google, it's an amazing uh, period in time. Fortunately now, what we're trying to do is to be a little bit more natural about the way that we go about our mastering processes. So keep this processor in mind, the adaptive loom is amazingly powerful, but judge the music that you're making and work out how much of its dynamic range you want to continue to maintain. So when I've got a master that I'm happy with, obviously what I'm in a position to do is to close these windows down, and get ready to bounce this again. Now, because I unsupported the tempo, my track effectively starts in bar two, but I need to be a little bit careful. I don't want to chop the very beginning off it. So what I'm gonna do is to go back to the beginning and just add, uh, I don't know, a semi-quaver or so, just a tiny little bit of silence so I don't just clip the very beginning of the file. And what I'm also going to do is to just ever so slightly pull the endpoint back here and we could add a fade. Again, in the toolbox, I've got a fade tool and I can add just a fade over this, which should just be added to the file as it goes down. So this time what we're going to do is we are going to monitor um, a bounce as it goes down in real time so we can just hear this project one more time before we finish up. Just before we do though, there's one more consideration I need to make. I don't want to show off about it, but this MacBook Pro has been handling 96 kilohertz of audio streams the whole afternoon, all coming in with multi-track recording projects and all the processing that we've been doing. It's not the most compatible format in the world, okay? So at this stage, having got to this point where what I want to do now is to become a little bit more compatible with the outside world, it's now time for me to think a little bit about downscaling the resolution of this file so that it can go on CD and go into other workstations as well. So at this point, what I'm going to do is to take my full frequency file and I'm gonna take it down to 44.1 kilohertz and I'm gonna take it down to 16 bit. Now then, I need to be a little bit careful because all of the resolution that we've been working at is just gonna get chopped off, snipped completely, unless I'm a little bit careful about how I downscale the resolution of this file at this stage. So if I apply what's called no dithering at this stage, I am simply gonna lose all of that additional resolution and Logic's not gonna think about how to deal with that in a way that hopefully will make more musical sense. Alternatively, what I can do is to select one of these algorithms in here and what that will do is to switch on an engine which is gonna fold down that resolution and think a little bit more carefully about the audio quality. Now, what I would say is be careful with dithering, only use it at the mastering stage. It's not something you need to think about beforehand, but it's also absolutely worth exploring what the options are here and how they work. So we're gonna create a stereo interleave file and we're all good, ready to go. But the great thing about the way that I can work is that if I want to, I can also create MP3s and M4A files at exactly the same time. If I want to, I can hit these checkboxes, come into each of these and make uh, choices about the quality of the MP3s and the M4As that I'm bouncing out, and Logic will create all of them for me at once if I go through and just press the OK button. Now, I want a real-time bounce, and actually, I only want a full-frequency file for now. So what I'm gonna do is to select that option, press OK, and this time, 
on the desktop, we can create our file name, and I like to add the all-important little mastered thing so that I know this is my master version as opposed to my mixed file. A lover's heart can be cool A lover's heart can be so cool I'm out here breaking the rules Hear my heart beating louder Cause I've got nothing to lose Okay, so just before I let you go, let's just have a little bit of a summary about mastering and understand exactly what we've looked at, because this is the section that may be newest to most of you. So when it comes to mastering, what are we talking about? We're talking about post-mix processing of a stereo audio file. What do I mean about that? We've got a stereo audio file, and we can add a new layer of processing at this last stage. In particular, this is a time to think about tone and dynamic shaping. We had our channel EQ ready to step in if we needed it, and I almost certainly would have made changes there given a little bit longer, and maybe an environment more adapted to mastering, but we've also looked at the multiband compressor and the adaptive limiter. We've also got powerful metering options which are allowing us to see exactly the changes that we're making, so we can see in the multimeter down on the right-hand side all of the content that's coming in and how it's behaving over time. And then lastly, what we're in a position to do is to start thinking about bouncing multiple audio files. So I've just chosen to bounce a full frequency file on its own, but I could also have rendered MP3s and M4A files at exactly the same time, ready for those files to go off into the distance in the way that uh, I might want them to, either uploading to SoundCloud or sending off um, as email attachments. Okay, so the only thing that's really left for me to do is just to thank you enormously for coming this afternoon. But we need to be a little bit careful here as well. I don't want you to take away from this project that you need to make music that sounds exactly like this. That's not really the point of what this afternoon was about. What I'm hoping is that you'll take away from it a whole series of techniques that you can creatively apply to your own projects, whether that's the editing tools we looked at, the production tricks we used, the mix techniques that we went through, or just focused on this martyring section at the end. What we've got within Logic is this amazingly creative tool set, regardless of the musical genres that you favor, and hopefully this afternoon you've had a chance to see some new tricks which will enhance your own productions. Thanks so much. I'll see you again soon. <laughs>